Hello everybody. I'm going to talk uh, today just about one of the late collections of Liszt's piano pieces, but one of the most important things from his last years, which is the third and final book of the Année de Périnage. As I'm sure you all know, the first two years, one called Switzerland, the other one called Italy, were issued in the 1850s although they'd had a very long gestation, the music for some of them dating back as far as 1836. The pieces in the third book were all finally ready and published in 1883, but some of them had been on his desk for quite a while, and some of them went through many, many layers of revision. There are seven pieces in all. The first one is called Angelus, and that started life in 1877 as a piece that he was writing for his granddaughter. But like so many of the pieces he was writing for his granddaughter, he kept on revising it to make it better. And by the time she eventually got the piece, she was fully grown adult. The same thing happened with the Christmas tree suite, which he started back in 1876, but the version that we all know came from the 1880s. This piece, Angelus, subtitled um, Prier aux Anges Gardiens, uh, Prayer to the Guardian Angels, um, <clears throat> started out as a piece in 3 4, and it went through a total of, we think, probably seven versions for piano solo as well as three versions for strings before he stopped messing about with it and printed the final version in the beginning of the third année. He still indicates here, as he does in all of the earlier versions, that it can be played on a harmonium, for which we might also read organ. And there's just one passage left in the published version where the harmonium or organ can play But the piano text of that passage is and <clears throat> that's very appropriate for a piano but as you can tell I was using the sustaining pedal and that wouldn't work on the harmonium. So we will now neglect the harmonium version for the rest of this conversation and see what this piece is made of. One of the most important things about all of the pieces in this book is to choose a tempo at which the music flows and tells its story. Liszt writes at the beginning Andante Pietoso, which is not to be confused with Adagio of any kind, and it's definitely two in the bar. It's, a, it's in 6-8, um, and if you go far enough into the piece for the main theme, which is this, and so on. So if that gives you a tempo of then the beginning And there's an atmosphere that he sets up here which is very simple and straightforward. It's like being in the countryside. It's definitely written in, f for, and about Italy, like most of the things in this book, and indeed the second edition of the volume also called it Italy, as well as Anne de Pèlerinage, Troisième Année. So it's as well to know that he started writing this piece in Venice, and <clears throat> he finished it at the Villa d'Este, uh, which is, as I'm sure you know, south of Rome. There are a couple of features where he, he extended this piece. Every time he re revised it, he added a few extra things. And one of them is this just little passage of 
walking between one thing and another. And there are <clears throat> little walking passages like that that crop up in several of the numbers in, in the set. Otherwise, it's really quite a straightforward piece so long as you don't let it flag and it comes after the last big statement of the theme. There's some marvellous harmony because there's a great deal of uncertainty in this book, although it's a book entirely, I think, about Liszt's religious faith, uh, faith and doubt for many, many thinking people go hand in hand and Liszt is no exception to this, even though by this stage he was um, in holy orders and dressed like a Franciscan and was in fact by now canon of Albano. So this, the climax of this piece therefore looks as if it's going to be straightforward and then we have some really quite otherworldly harmonies. and then as if nothing had troubled him after all. The coda starts just as the piece began. Now I remarked that there are seven pieces in this book. The first and the last are both in E major, and the last one is also a hymn like Angelus. In this case it's Sursum Corda, which is the text at in the Mass at the elevation of the host, and it means lift up your heart. And this is another one of those pieces where you would think it would be quite a positive uh, thought. And it sort of is, and it emerges very positively and triumphantly at the end, but it goes through something fairly close to the agonies of the damned to get there, and into some very, very strange harmonies, which uh, come out at the end they thin themselves out into a whole tone scale just before you have the recapitulation of the principal theme. And this is music which pretty well nobody would have understood at the time of, of writing. And uh, so I'm just going to play a little bit out of the middle of it, but it's the principal theme when it gets a little bit agitato.
So you can look at these two hymns as being more or less the hello and goodbye for the set, the bookends if you like, and they are cast in E major, which is a key that he uses for many of his religious pieces, especially religious pieces that seem to have uh, a very happy ending. I think of the Tu es Petrus from Christus, um, the finale of St. Elizabeth. There's, there's, there's quite a few. At uh, the, the end of the second legend of St. Francis of Paolo walking on the waves, e, ma e major is a key that he often uses for this. Right in the middle of this set is the best known piece, and it is called Je de la Ville d'Este. And this is the heart of the collection. It's always been very popular. It's cast in F sharp major, which is a key that he normally reserves for very special and intimate religious experiences. For example, Benediction de Dieu dans la solitude, which is one of the best pieces in F sharp that he ever wrote, and this is another. It's famous for a number of reasons. Uh, of course, it's a very influential piece and other people who are writing music about fountains certainly copied many of the effects in it. And there is the curious anomaly of a theme which Claude Debussy may or may not have borrowed intentionally, but... Um with um, in the Lierschweyers. The important thing about this piece is it is not just a depiction of the fountains of the Villa d'Este. If you go to Tivoli and you go to this marvelous villa, it's perched on the top of a hill next to the church. And when Liszt lived there, he lived in the topmost floor and he had a balcony that actually runs over the roof of part of it. And from the end of this balcony, he could look down into the gardens of the Villa d'Este, looking at the cypresses and the fountains from many, many hundreds of feet above. And so I think that this is really much more religious, mystical music than it is simply a depiction of nature. Where he was standing on the ramparts of this building, he could see into Rome, 30 miles away. And it was also a marvelous place to view the setting sun or the rising sun. And in the middle of this piece, Liszt also quotes a passage from the Gospel of St. John about um, Jesus offering water which will become a spring of eternal life to whomever drinks it. And he writes this out very clearly, the whole text uh, from the um, Latin version of the Bible, um, just at this point where this happens. And it's, it's very well prepared by some of, you know, nice nature music, if you like, but... Um which is one of the loveliest transitions, I think, in all of his late works. The rest of it, just for performance purposes, is to try and keep the tremolos as quiet as possible and pick out the melody line which is in amongst them, this one. Very carefully you do that with your thumb. It may help not to start the tremolo until after you've hit the melody note, so very slowly. Oh. It's not really cheating, but it might, it might just help. 
The piece is marked Allegretto, and uh, it's very often played, I think, at breakneck speed, and then, the, then pianists have to slow it down. But if you start... I think that's enough tempo, especially for the page on the next, the next page, which has... which is very easy to mess up and make um, uneven in performance. One thing to point out on this page is list pedaling, which is very carefully thought out. So you have in one pedal, then in no pedal, Some unthinking editors have added extra pedal marks here, and you very often hear. But if you try and get the differences, then the phrase breathes much better. That's just one small thing. The other, th there's a, one very tricky passage where it is very easy to mess up the pedaling. You've got to play. And the job is always to put the bass note on the, pe on the beat. And keep the pedal clean and the harmonies easily recognizable without worrying too much about because they will take care of themselves and as a matter of fact they won't upset the pedaling harmonies at all if the if the rest is clear so that's the, that's the piece in the middle and that's the piece that this whole collection moves towards and away from before and after this piece and inside the bookends of the two hymns we have four elegies and they are very different in character and intent. The first two bear the same title apart from a figure at the end which is to say Au Cypre de la Villa d'Este which is at the Cypresses of the Villa d'Este and a subtitle Threnody and the, sec the first one's just called Threnody 1, the second one just Threnody 2. Otherwise, the titles are the same. And although you can hear swaying trees in them, they're clearly really quite pronounced laments for something, which Liszt hasn't told us. And um, we have to be content with just regarding them as, as general elegies. But the first one is really quite remarkable for this harmony. and so on. And it gets quite frenzied in the middle. And it's in fact, I think technically the hardest piece in the set. And there is an Osea passage when things get very turbulent and stormy. And as so often with Liszt, it's very clear that the piece that's printed on the extra staff is actually what he preferred. And is much more pianistically interesting. There's nearly always a, a choice of text where one is much simpler to play than the other one. And I think we can be reasonably assured that on most of these occasions, Liszt would have written the more difficult one for his own use. And he still always thought that some of his late pieces would be playable by amateurs. I think he was wrong, but uh, 
because there's always something in there that is too difficult for anybody but a, a proper and experienced performer to, to deal with. But uh, it's the passage where the left hand goes. Which is the Osir text and the principal text is just. Which you can make triumphantly menacing if you wish, but it, it's going to be a lot easier if you go with the The second Cypress's piece has sometimes been suggested that it, it, it owes some kind of debt to uh, Tristan and Isolde. I personally don't see it. It begins, I suppose you could say, but... The passage in Tristan is which I think is actually a lot more comfortable and comforting than Liszt's text. Be it as it may, I don't think there's any deliberate cribbing going on. And the cribbing, of course, between Liszt and Wagner was usually in the opposite direction. The little footsteps that I spoke of in connection with Angelus are in very clear evidence here. And it becomes fairly clear that we are celebrating in some way the death of a heroic person, possibly somebody who was a warrior, who knows. But there is this martial passage which crops up twice in the piece, which you have to play with, a, with proper nobility, as you do actually everything by list. Nobility and elegance are the watchwords. But that theme immediately gives way, gives way to one of the most winsome passages that Liszt ever wrote. And it's very, very simple in its conception, but it's the thing that you remember from this piece above all others, I think.
So these three themes are the elements that make up the piece. It ends with a last reference to those beautifully arpeggiated passages, and then it trails away into silence with just a single line of notes, which are the opening theme, which, uh, well, I don't need to illustrate that, I don't think. The two other elegies are much more specific in their subject matter, and they come after the Je de la Villa d'Este. The first one of these starts without any key signature and is full of Hungarian harmonies. It's called Sunt Lacrimae Rerum, which is a quotation from uh, Virgil, and it's about, and there, and there, uh, there were tears. Um, and it's referring, I think, to the futility of war. And in particular, this piece harks back to his earlier piece called Finerai, which was written in 1849, or at least commemorate events of 1849, when, as we all know, the revolutionary government of Hungary was individually and collectively rounded up and executed. And some of these people, of course, had been Liszt's friends, and um, he stayed in touch with several of their relations and uh, was always shocked that the uh, Hungarians had suffered this blow. Because although he didn't sit on the ramparts or anything, he did support the 1848 revolution. So this piece is marked en mode en gras, and is full of references to Hungarian type cadences, and it even quotes a bit of the Hungarian national anthem, the Sozat, um, which you'll recognize or not as the case may be. But the And the next part of it which is possibly the loudest noise that Liszt ever required you to make at a piano. The piece does sort of have some kind of resolution, but it's with a cadence which is so strange that it takes a while to get used to it. Um, by the, by the end of the piece, he's moved into a key signature of three sharps, so you're expecting it possibly to finish in A major, or maybe 
F sharp minor. He approaches it by way of A minor, has a cadence into F sharp major, and then right at the end he switches the F sharp major chord into an A major chord, and this is some kind of closure, but it's really quite astonishing that he dared to do it. which is very uncompromising, but actually is the tonal center that we have been looking for for the last couple of pages. I think it's important in this piece not to let the tempo drag because the, the big climax absolutely demands a certain amount of movement. And the, the, the tempo can be a little flexible. The earlier manuscript of it, in fact, there's a couple of tempo changes which he didn't carry over into the final version, but perhaps he did that merely by accidental omission. The last piece we're going to talk about is the penultimate one, and it's very often dated at 1867, which makes it earlier than everything else, but uh, it's very hard to know whether that's absolutely right. The event that it commemorates certainly took place in 1867, but the piece was revised again as late as 1883. The title is Marche Funèbre, which is self-explanatory. En mémoire de Maximilien, empereur de Mexique. Um, Maximilien was a, an archbishop and a politician of sorts who, for some reason, accepted the invitation to take over the throne of Mexico. And the person who invited him and put him there was the very person who then within a very short time not only deposed him, but also had him shot. And uh, he was a kind-hearted and good-hearted man, and Liszt knew him personally. And so when Liszt got to hear of, of his death, wrote this piece. And there's a little um, Latin proverb at the beginning, which comes from Papertius, um, which roughly speaking means, even to have thought of great things is an achievement in itself, uh, recognizing that this is a man whose life's ambitions were not properly fulfilled, even though he had very noble thoughts about um, taking on the job that he was offered in Mexico very seriously. So this piece starts in the depths of the piano, a bit like the middle of the last one, and with both hands marked ottava bassa, which means you are way down the bottom end. But eventually we have the actual movement of a funeral march. So. You have that a couple of times, and eventually you get to... Importantly, this piece like many of the pieces in this book, is marked andante at the beginning, not adagio. And perhaps one should think of the marvelous piece by Berlioz called Grand Symphonie Funèbre Triomphale to get the...
which I wish Liszt had transcribed for the piano. But um, that is one of those pieces that gives you an archetypal tempo of a march that can actually be marched to. And that should set this piece up very well. There is a reference to things very nasty by with a, with a storm and, a, and an ascending scale, which is as anguished and not encountered again anything similar to it, I don't think, until perhaps the end of the slow movement of Sibelius Symphony Number no. Four. But uh, it's quite remarkable. And this slight change of tack at the end into F sharp major allows Liszt to write, it's not quite a happy ending, but it's certainly marked triomphante, because as if to say that Maximilian's life was not in vain, and, and by extension, uh, all people who have died in similar circumstances. So even list through the fact that most of these pieces have an air of deep sadness about them, he comes out of it optimistic and no accident of course that he's in F sharp major because that's, that's where he thinks he can hang on to his faith uh, the most deeply. And so <clears throat> he is quite happy then to plunge into Susan Corda and bring the cycle actually to a very firmly positive ending. So that's the third book of the Anne de Perinage, quite different from the other two, but very, very worth exploring and playing actually in its entirety. Thank you. <laughs>